I guess we all know by now that artificial intelligence is growing fast, but soil is literally billions of years more advanced technology. What are soil's stunning abilities? How did soil achieve its shocking technical superiority over AI? And what does this mean for cities? In this episode, I'll provide my take on the topic as a former mobile app coder, market gardener, urbanist, and certified permaculture designer. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. And just in case you're new to the channel, Edenicity is a measure of ecological plus economic abundance. It's also the merging of permaculture and urbanism. And finally, it hopefully will someday soon have the literal meaning of an Edenic city, a place that is ecologically sound, heals the world, and thrives in a world where people have choices. If this is intriguing to you, look for that subscribe button, and if it's down there, go ahead and tap it so you don't miss out. As you can imagine, people have wanted artificial intelligence for thousands of years. We've modeled it mathematically for over a hundred years, and had electrical models for about a hundred years. But it's only in the past five years or so that the fields really exploded with the convergence of neural networks and graphics graphics processing units, or GPUs. As the name implies, graphics processing units are used in computer visualization to do the highly repetitive work of doing a similar operation on many, many elements of an image at once. These have been used in movies, desktop games, and console games, such as this Tapwave Zodiac, which ran my Two Sky software 20 years ago. The thing that sets a GPU apart from the CPU that you find in your computer is, again, the ability to handle many, many processes all at the same time. This turns out to be a really good fit to neural networks, which were the key to unlocking AI. The red background over here is a magnified section of the neurons of a mouse, connected by an intricate network of nerves. To understand what's going on, I made a much simpler model over here with spheres. The input layer would be your senses, such as the photoreceptors in the retina of your eyes. The hidden layer would be the neurons in your brain, that those photoreceptors connect to through the optic nerve. There are actually many hidden layers of neurons that are recording information. The way they do that is that, for example, the part of the back of your eye that is seeing the red parts of this slide here are sending more signals to the neurons that they're connected to. And there's far fewer photoreceptors sending signals to neurons corresponding to blue. The neurons then connect layer to layer and neuron to neuron based on the signals that they're getting. The stronger the signals, the stronger the connections between them. So when you're looking at this image here and you see all of these red neurons, all of the neurons in your brain that are seeing those blotches of red are lighting up and forming connections to one another and associating these shapes to one another so that over time the neurons are trained. This is the process known as training. Eventually your understanding becomes quite sophisticated. I can show you this slide later on and you would recognize that this is an actual neural net and you'd be able to distinguish between the actual electron micrograph of the mouse neurons and the model that I've made and understand the difference between them because you saw them differently and associated them differently in your brain. And those connections were reinforced through a process of training, which is almost instantaneous in terms of our perception. All that AI does now is run very large neural networks on very large numbers of graphics processing units. And although you may have read that AI is growing fast, it's growing even faster than you think. Pictured below is the NVIDIA DGX H100, which is about five times as fast as the hardware that was used to train ChatGPT. NVIDIA is projected to sell over for half a million of these units by the end of this year. And they have many hardware rivals in the chip manufacturing world who will be releasing to similar or larger volumes in the future. In other words, the pace of AI, although it's been breathtaking in just the last year or so, is likely to pick up several million fold. What would that be like? Well, a number of other YouTubers really cover this in depth. Wes Roth provides daily news about AI. David Shapiro gets a little bit deeper into the longer term social and philosophical implications of AI in our culture. And one of the things that he said was that AI will displace so many jobs that we're going to go into an era that he calls post-scarcity economics, which would give us free fusion energy and allow us to live anywhere. And I'll comment a little bit about that later. But the problem with AI right now is that it consists mainly of language models. Even the AIs that produce motion pictures and graphics are based on language models. And life is way bigger than language. I believe that there's a fundamental entropy limit 
to how fast AI can progress and that it will depend on having people in the loop to keep it calibrated and keep it on track for a really, really long time to come. For example, I was a really big fan of autonomous vehicles and self-driving vehicles, but Ben Jordan did a video where he put a dummy of a child in the roadway in front of his Tesla and tested to see whether it would stop for the dummy. Spoiler alert, it was a little disappointing. And he goes really deep into the statistics about why he thinks that we're not going to see self-driving cars mixing with regular traffic at scale. And I can believe it. Life is more complex than these language models because it embodies a very deep history on this planet. And I've been around long enough to notice that tech culture kind of feels antagonized by history itself. And what I mean by this is that many people in the sciences, myself included, have a bit of a chip on our shoulders about Giordano Bruno and and uh, Galileo, Galilei, who suffered mightily for pursuing the truth. Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake, among other things, for saying that the stars might actually be other solar systems with planets that went around them. And Galileo was put under house arrest for making observations of the moon and Jupiter and other celestial bodies that began to imply that the stuff that's out there in the heavens is made of the same stuff as here on Earth. The randomness of history, the sheer nonsense folded into history drives tech people crazy. But, as I will show, the deep history of life has value. And here's where our story really takes off. What is intelligence? Well, for the longest time, people thought of intelligence as almost synonymous with knowledge. It was the ability to store knowledge and make inferences based on that knowledge. But there's a twist on this theory that I think is going to give us deeper insights as time goes on. This twist was suggested by the inventor of the Palm Pilot, Jeff Hawkins, that intelligence is the ability to accurately model, predict, and respond to a dynamic environment. It's not just how much you know, but how well you can respond to change. Now, as you can imagine, any living being that is better equipped than its peers to respond to change has a big survival advantage. So intelligence gradually, inevitably becomes integral to life. Nothing in the living world is more dynamic, complex, and alive than soil. In a small lump of garden soil, you can easily find a trillion individual microorganisms. If it's garden soil, this will span some 10,000 species. Compare that to the number of species that you could possibly catalog on an entire continent, which would be about 200,000 species. Well, in a healthy forest soil, you'll find a million species. How many species could you hold in the palm of your hand? Well, if you're holding a lump of garden soil, you could hold 10,000 species. But if you're holding a lump of forest soil, you're holding a million species, and those million species are much, much better at holding on to nutrients than the garden soil, which has been tilled and aerated and chemically treated, all of which vastly reduces the biodiversity within the soil. Our interactions with the soil are often an absolute catastrophe for the rich ecologies within the soils. Soils contain fungi, protists, archaea, bacteria, algae, each of which is far more sophisticated than a self-driving car. After all, they can forage for food on their own. They can reproduce. They can heal from injuries. They can compete. They can recycle. They've been optimized over countless generations for energy efficiency and miniaturization. Soil microbes evolved in vast, complex, multi-species communities under tremendous selection pressure over trillions of generations spanning half a billion years. And their existence is built on billions of years of oceanic evolution that came before them. So soils have some surprising abilities. For example, could any of today's AIs, such as ChatGPT, rewire themselves down to the atoms? For example, could ChatGPT replace all of the copper in all of its microchips with silver? I don't mean just analyze the process or make a list of steps that you have to follow or describe what you need to do, but I mean physically rebuild the microchips of which it is made in real time while it is still running. Right now, AI can't do this, but soil can. This study isolated bacteria that grew in the arsenic-rich mud of Mono Lake in California. They put them in bottles with nutrient broth, and then the researchers removed phosphorus, which is a macronutrient found in every cell of every living being, and replaced it with arsenic. And gradually, over the course of months, the bacteria replaced all of the phosphorus atoms in its cellular structure and its DNA with arsenic. It rewired itself in real time while it was alive. If intelligence is the ability 
ability to respond to change. This is phenomenal intelligence that we are a very long way from replicating. The question is, how did it emerge? Well, it had a research and development program. Invention requires repetition, testing, and variation. The Edison light bulb, for example, famously took over 10,000 experiments to perfect. Now, today there are some 5 million patents in the world, although many of these patents are just updates of earlier inventions. So let's assume that throughout history, the human race has had 100 million fundamentally different inventions. This would be a one followed by eight zeros, or 10 to the eighth inventions. And let's further imagine that most inventors aren't as sophisticated as Thomas Edison and require a few more iterations to get it right. So let's assume 100,000 experiments to perfect every one of those 100 million inventions that we've used in all of human history. This is a total of 10 to the 13th experiments, or 10 trillion experiments that have gone into building the modern world. How does that compare to soil research and development? Well, back in the 1960s, when NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was starting to think about space colonies, they brought in a famous ecologist, by the name of H.T. Odom to provide some feedback. And Odom's basic point was that our mechanical systems will not be more efficient than natural biological systems in providing for human needs. Because you can think of each soil microbe as a little experiment in life support. It needs to find food, resist disease, resist cold and heat, hide from or fight off predators, and it needs to recover from toxicity. In the life of any microbe, there can be hundreds or thousands of such events. Each microbe is a copy of the prior generations, usually with slight variations. These can be mutations, these can be due to the exchange of genetic material through a whole variety of means with other microbes, including from other species. Variations that are beneficial to the microbe, of course, tend to be passed on to succeeding generations. But not only that, variations that are beneficial to life itself in that environment are also passed on. So microbes become both better adapted and more adaptable, both as individuals and in very complex synergistic ecologies. Even though every microbial life has thousands of complex interactions, let's think of that life as just one experiment and ask how many total experiments have there been among soil microbes through all of history? What is the total soil research and development budget over all of time? Okay, so I do some math here with earth radius and soil depth and land area, scoop size and so on and so forth, and come up with four times 10 to the 44th, or four followed by 44 zeros, which is a pretty hard number to wrap your head around. So I thought I would divide it by the number of experiments that people have done. The human invention, again, was about 10 trillion experiments, 10 to the 13th. And let's imagine this inscribing all of those on one grain of sand. So the question is, how many grains of sand would you need to express the R&D embodied in soil? That number is about 4 times 10 to the 31. And assuming that your sand grains are sort of average in size, a medium size, sand has a big range of sizes, so I could kind of pick the number that worked here, you end up with a sphere very close to the same size as the Earth. In other words, in a pile of sand as big as the entire globe, one grain of sand is all of human invention, and all the remaining grains of sand represent the R&D that went into creating soil ecology. Now, what does this mean for cities? First of all, there is no technological replacement for soil. Without soil, sooner or later, we starve. Because even if we pump it full of macronutrients, it erodes away and is useless to us. We co-evolved with soil. The smell of geosmin, which is in petrichor, that smell of rain at a distance, comes from soil bacteria. And we can smell it at five parts per trillion. That's an incredible level of sensitivity. And by the way, exposure to petrichor, that smell of soil, has known antidepressant effects. So we are very deeply linked to soil ecology as living beings in a way that precedes language and embodies a vastly bigger intelligence than language. But sadly, sprawl and industrial agriculture, as I showed in the last episode, are destroying soils worldwide. Fortunately, urban agriculture, as I showed in that episode, can reverse this trend. We live in a world where the urban population is growing by 200,000 people a day and is expected to do so through 2050, at which point we'll have 2 billion more people living in cities. Edenicity is an urban design system to accommodate all of this growth and more in such a way that we can provide all the energy, housing, transportation, and food that we need within the cities. And this in turn allows us to restore the 50% of the living biomass that we have wiped out to date. 
But a key part of this success is as people migrate to cities from rural areas, cities need to value their indigenous agrarian knowledge if it hasn't been damaged by industrial agriculture, because this knowledge has an unbroken lineage back to the soil from which we evolved and will very likely be a key to sustainable city design. I also believe that small-scale automation can help enormously. Now, I thought for a concluding slide, I would ask ChatGPT, the generative pre-trained transformer that we're all familiar with by now, to draw using DALI a street scene of Paris decades after it's gotten rid of cars. And I gave it this detailed prompt here. Here's what it came up with. And as you can see, ChatGPT basically botched the instructions. I have tried hundreds of times to get the various AIs to draw Edenicity. And they always do something like this. I I have played with prompts. I've broken the prompts down into smaller pieces. It's been a very frustrating exercise. Part of it is that these are pre-trained transformers. These are pre-trained intelligences. So they are all backward looking. And sadly, so is much of urban planning as it stands today. When you ask ChatGPT to draw a city, it's going to think of streets and cars, no matter what you tell it. So this weekend, one of my projects is to dig into the programming interface behind ChatGPT and try to get in at a deeper layer and work with it to help me imagine Edenicity. Because if I can do that, maybe I can start to roll out detailed Edenicity plans for actual cities. And believe me, if that succeeds, you'll be the first to know on this channel. So if that sounds good, leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss it. And here are those episodes, I promise. The most recent one on top. Take care, stay green, see you next time.